Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We've been working our way through the book of Exodus and tonight we're in Exodus chapter 27. So as always, we want to invite you to be finding a copy of the Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 27. We'll be there in just a few moments. If you have any questions, any comments or concerns about tonight's class, feel free to get in touch. If you have something that we need to be praying about, let us know. We'd be glad to do that. You can send me a message, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You could also call or send a text to 608 224 0274. Well, like I said, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. The people have left Egypt and they are now in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai. God is now communicating some very key parts of the law of Moses uh, to the prophet Moses, and we're now continuing with God's instructions for building a tabernacle. Uh, the tabernacle was to be a tent that was to be used for worship. And up to this point, we've had God's command to take up a free will offering to come up with the supplies that are needed and all of the materials for building it. We've had instructions for constructing the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and the lampstand. And last week, we looked at God's instructions for some of the fabric, the walls and the partitions in the tabernacle. And we've had some of the instructions now uh, for the planks that were to be used in the walls of this tent. Well, this past Lord's Day morning, one of our members just very briefly kind of wondered about those planks, and it was an interesting question. But as we learned last week, they were to be 15 feet long and 27 inch wide. They were to be covered in gold. And basically, if I could summarize, the uh, question was, well, how did they do that? How did they make planks that were 15 feet long by 27 inches wide? And what did those planks look like, practically speaking? I mean, obviously, they didn't have table saws and planers and belt sanders and uh, routers and so many of the other tools that we have around us today. And I think it's an interesting question. Uh, even with the tools that we have between us here at the Four Lakes Congregation, I, th I think that uh, we might even have a hard time uh, shaping dozens of planks 27 inches wide by 15 feet long. If you just think about that from a, a practical point of view, um, you know, on the other hand, I know it's kind of wondering how they got that done, but we also need to realize that there were some expert craftsmen back there in the ancient world, and they did have tools that they could use. Uh, I remember one of my favorite shopping experiences through the years has been going to Layman's, an Amish or Mennonite hardware store. I think it was started by an Amish missionary, who, or a, a, a Mennonite missionary who came back from Africa in the 60s. And he was frustrated that he couldn't find non-electric tools out there on his mission field. So he came back and he uh, moved right into the middle of Amish country. And he started a non-electric hardware store. And there are some interesting woodworking tools in this guy's store, to say the least. If you're ever uh, kind of in central to northeast Ohio, I would highly recommend that you stop by there. But just talking about being able to do some of this stuff, uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, but let's remember that these people probably had some skills. They were builders back in Egypt. We know that they were uh, making bricks primarily. But I'm assuming that out of two to three million people, they probably would have had some other skills as well. And we really do have some amazing craftsmanship that... Uh, uh, that we find in the ancient world. I know it's later in history, but years ago we went down to Chicago to the Field Museum to see a special exhibit on Pompeii, and they had displays of some of what had been recovered from Pompeii after the volcanic eruption over there, and the jewelry in that display was absolutely amazing. They had uh, earrings, they had necklaces, and I'll tell you, the clasps on those necklaces look like something that you might find at the Diamond Center across from Westtown Mall here in Madison if you were to go over there tonight. I mean, I think I was expecting some kind of crude or twisted wire or something, uh, but that is not what we found at all. I just remember being amazed by the craftsmanship. And so, you know, I'm thinking that we might also be amazed at what some of these ancient people were able to construct out there in the desert with uh, limited uh, tools. You know, they had the materials, they also had the skills, and if they didn't have the tools, I'm thinking they might have been able to actually make some of the tools that were needed for this project. So I just wanted to kind of pass that along as an interesting observation from one of our members based on our study last week. How did they get that done? And I think that, uh, I think we might be surprised at some of the craftsmanship from the ancient world. 
Well, tonight we get back to the tabernacle, so we're looking at the altar first of all tonight, and then we'll close by uh, thinking about the courtyard of the tabernacle and the fencing or the barrier, the curtains that were hanging around it. And tonight's chapter is really short, and so our, I think our class should be a bit shorter than usual tonight. But let's jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. And you shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners, its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. You shall make its pails for removing its ashes, and its shovels, and its basins, and its forks, and its firepans. You shall make all its utensils of bronze. You shall make for it a grating of network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. You shall put it beneath under the ledge of the altar so that the net will reach halfway up the altar. You shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. Its poles shall be inserted into the ring so that the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with planks as it was shown to you on the mountain, so they shall make it. Several weeks ago, we started with the Ark of the Covenant, which really seems to be the main feature of the tabernacle, certainly the most important part of it, I would say. And I think we would agree with that. That's where God would come and meet the people. And so we slowly moved out from there. And now that we've covered the tent and almost everything that was to be inside the tent, we'll get to the one thing we've missed later. But we now move to the courtyard, so outside of the tent itself. And in the courtyard... Uh, one of the main features is the altar. Like the other furniture, the altar is to be made with acacia wood. But notice that instead of being covered in gold, the altar is to be covered in bronze. And I kind of wonder about that. Why is that? And at first in my mind, I thought, well, you know, maybe bronze has a, a higher melting point than gold since the altar will actually have a, a fire in it. And I looked into that a little bit. That does not seem to be it. I know a lot of you know a lot more about metal than I do. Uh, as best I can tell, bronze has a melting point of around 1700 Fahrenheit, but it's an alloy, and so the exact melting point would depend on the proportion of uh, metals in it. And gold, I think, actually has a higher melting point, around 1900 Fahrenheit. So I, I don't really know why uh, the altar is to be covered in bronze instead of gold. If you have any ideas about that, I would love it if you could let me know. Uh, I'm curious. I don't know why God said it and uh, uh, arranged it in this way. I'm just not sure. We're not told. Uh, as to the measurements, when we convert cubits into feet, the altar is to be a square, uh, roughly seven and a half feet on each side, six feet tall. It is to be made with horns on the corners. And I don't know if the horns were just decorative, if this was to hang the sacrifices on. I think they were supposed to spread some of the blood in a representative type way on the on the horns of the altar. Maybe that's so people could see it. Uh, I'm not sure. We're not told in this passage. Uh, we do know that people who killed somebody by accident could come and they could hold on to the horns. Um, I think we've got that a little bit later. Uh, when somebody kills somebody, they come and they, they grab onto the horns of the altar, kind of begging for mercy. You know, you can't touch me here. I'm, I'm holding on to the altar. This is almost like a home base in a game of tag. Uh, but in addition to the altar itself, notice they were to make this collection of utensils. And these also were to be made of bronze. So we have buckets and shovels and basins and forks and fire pans. So uh, obviously I don't think they had matches as we would understand it today. So a fire pan would contain some coals that they would maintain and uh, continue on that fire. Uh, on top of the altar, at some point in there, they were to have a grate uh, also made of bronze where the sacrifice could be burned. And like the other furniture, the altar was also to be built, notice, with rings and poles. So the purpose there was to make it portable so it could be carried. And at the end, we find the whole thing is to be hollow. So obviously this would be uh, lighter than a solid unit, but it would also provide space for the fire and then a place for those ashes to fall. Uh, just reading over this paragraph a few times, one thing I appreciate about this is that, uh, you know, the buckets and the shovels kind of seem pretty boring. So every day... It's just interesting that we have these details, you know, make a shovel, make a bucket, make a fire pan, and so on. But those buckets and those shovels, they were necessary for the Lord's work to go on. 
And I know this is not a, a perfect parallel by any means, but you know the Lord's money is also spent on some pretty boring stuff even today. I don't know if you realize this, but we look at the church budget or the, we look at the expenses that get turned in from time to time. And the Lord's money, even today, certainly does get spent on stuff like brooms and snow shovels and gas for the snowblower and soap and shingles and electricity. And, you know, these things are not holy in and of themselves, but all of those things are, are pretty important. You know, if we don't have that snow shovel, we're not getting in on Sunday and so on. If we don't have the gas for the snowblower, again, we're not getting in on Sunday and so on. Uh, but I just find it interesting how God gives instructions for these rather boring details. Um, little shovels and buckets for ashes are included in the inspired record. And those details cease to be boring, I think, when we understand that they were there for a much greater purpose. Uh, so also with the money that we spend on seemingly boring things today. Well, as with the other pieces of furniture, God not only provides a verbal description, uh, notice here at the end, he also refers to having already showed Moses uh, some kind of visual representation up on the mountain. So there is a written record, but there is a, also some kind of vision as to this is what I'm talking about. This is what this thing should look like. And so Moses is then responsible uh, for explaining this and passing it along to the workmen as they will eventually get around to creating these things. Before we move on, I wanted to share an image of another model of the tabernacle featuring the altar out there in the courtyard in front of the tabernacle itself. And I hope we notice the horns there on the four corners of the altar. I also hope we notice the ramp leading up to this, coming in from the left side. Uh, several weeks ago, you may remember, we had that passage where we learned that they were to have a ramp so that the nakedness of the priest was not exposed to the people during worship. And so God said, no stairs. I don't want you showing off in that way. I want a ramp so it's very, very dignified. And so there was a reason then for that ramp. I'm just pointing it out here because I don't think we had it in this paragraph, but that was something that he uh, detailed earlier a few chapters ago. But again, uh, the altar roughly seven or uh, six feet tall by seven and a half feet square. And I kind of thought this image might help us to picture this in our own mind. So uh, I'm six foot one and a quarter. So if I'm standing by it, uh, that, the, the altar would be about the same height that I am, if that, uh, if that helps us picture that. Okay, well, let's continue tonight with Exodus 27, <clears throat> verses 9 through 19. Exodus chapter 27, verses 9 through 19. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side there shall be hangings for the court of fine twisted linen, 100 cubits long for one side, and its pillars shall be 20, with their 20 sockets of bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be of silver. Likewise for the north side in length there shall be hangings, 100 cubits long, and its 20 pillars with their 20 sockets of bronze, the hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be of silver. For the width of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits with their ten pillars and their ten sockets. The width of the court on the east side shall be fifty cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. And for the other side shall be hangings of fifteen cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. For the gate of the court there shall be a screen of twenty cubits of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. The work of a weaver with their four pillars and their four sockets. All the pillars around the court shall be furnished with silver bands with their hooks of silver and their sockets of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits and the width 50 throughout and the height five cubits of fine twisted linen and their sockets of bronze. All the utensils of the tabernacle used in its service and all its pegs and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. Well, I don't think we need to analyze this word by word. This is not the most thrilling passage in all of Scripture. I hope it's safe to say that and admit that. But uh, basically, we have a description of the outer fence here, this fence that would wall off the actual tabernacle from the rest of the camp, a little bit of a barrier or a buffer around it. And this barrier would set the tabernacle apart as special. So this is not just another tent. You can't just walk up to it and touch it and and wander in and out. There is this uh, barricade, we might say, around it. And so this fence or this dividing line, this barricade, is to be made of fine twisted linen. And it is to then be held up 
by pillars and bands. I think we might say poles or bars. And this fence is basically a giant curtain, as I understand it. So these linen panels then are to hang from a series of poles and pillars. And like the rest of the tabernacle, everything is to be very easy to set up, very easy and quick to disassemble and take down. In this case, the outer fence is to be connected by these bronze sockets with these silver bands or poles. And so there is this plan for putting it up and taking it down very quickly and efficiently. Well, when we look at the measurements in this paragraph, we find that this enclosure, if I've done the calculations correctly, is to be roughly 150 feet long and 75 feet across. Or if I've calculated this correctly, again, just uh, converting from cubits to feet. Uh, the fence or the curtains are to, I think, be seven and a half feet tall. And so that height is obviously just tall enough to shield the people from whatever's going on inside the courtyard. And I would say it would also give worshipers some sense of privacy once they're on the inside. So they're not going to be people um, looking over, kind of a prairie dogging, we might say, and, and looking over into what's happening on the inside. But it's tall enough where uh, people would not be able to kind of look over that top edge. Uh, before we leave this paragraph, I wanted to share another drawing. This is a drawing of the tabernacle and the courtyard, kind of a, a bird's eye view. And I chose this one. I know it's an old drawing, but uh, it's public domain, and so we're allowed to share this on YouTube. But I chose this one because it does a pretty good job illustrating the fence around that courtyard. So to me, the proportions seem pretty good in this illustration. You can see the men walking around, and the fence seems to be... Uh, a foot and a half, two feet taller than they are, which probably would have been pretty accurate. So the curtains were, again, roughly seven and a half feet tall. And the courtyard was uh, 150 feet long by 75 feet wide. I think we kind of see that here. I want us to also notice something that we didn't, uh, we didn't look at this drawing last week. But notice the uh, layers on top of the tabernacle itself. I know it's not in this chunk of scripture. We've already studied this. But notice how that's layered and it's kind of peeled back for illustration purposes here. So I appreciate that <clears throat> um, in this particular illustration. And you might not be able to see all of this, uh, depending on the size of your screen, your resolution, but those flags, notice the flags around, like there's another perimeter, oh, maybe, what, 25, 50 feet even beyond the, uh, the uh, fence here. Um, those flags are labeled with the names of the 12 tribes. And we're going to find out later that the tribes were to camp out together. They were to stay tribe by tribe. They were not all to mix in. But each tribe would then have access to the tabernacle. So they would kind of radiate out from that center. And so I just wanted to point that out, that, that in this particular drawing, we have the flags of the tribes and uh, notice that they are labeled. Uh, the next one, in my opinion, is not to scale. At least this is just my observation of it. This is a, a worse scale wise so again the fence is seven and a half feet tall um if that is the case <laughs> notice the priest running around uh, in here how tall are those guys uh, they are really really short aren't they so if that fence is seven and a half feet tall uh these guys are like two or three feet tall so again the scale the proportion seems off on this one especially in terms of the fence uh, but i do though i do though like the color on this one and I like that we can see the, the tents radiating out from the tabernacle. So we see the tents of the people of Israel uh, all camped around this tabernacle. The tabernacle was to be the center of the camp. Uh, this is where they were to meet God. And of course, the uh, pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, would kind of park itself on top of the mercy seat. So it would kind of hover over the back uh, one-third of the tabernacle. And we see that in, uh, in this drawing. Well, let's conclude tonight the very last paragraph in chapter 27. This is chapter 27 of Exodus, verses 20 and 21. Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 and 21. You shall charge the sons of Israel that they shall bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. In the tent of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall keep it in order from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generations for the sons of Israel. Well, this is pretty unrelated to the whole fence around the tabernacle that this chapter has been focused on, but we have it here. Uh, the people are told to bring olive oil, and everybody is involved here to light the light of the lamp that we talked about a couple weeks ago. 
And I just want to emphasize in this last paragraph, this is a team effort. They are to keep the lamp burning continually on a regular basis with the oil that all of these people contribute to the Lord's work. And uh, this is not just to fall on one person. There is not the oil guy who has to pay for this oil and keep it going 24-7. This is not one family. This is not one tribe. Uh, but this will benefit everybody. And so everybody plays a part in keeping that lamp lit. And I just find that interesting in this closing paragraph. Uh, next week, well, right now we're, we're at the end of chapter 27. So, And as we pointed out over the past few weeks, ultimately everything we've read about tonight is merely a shadow uh, pointing ahead to what would come later in Jesus. According to Hebrews, uh, Jesus is a better sanctuary. So he is our tabernacle in a sense. We come to God through him. And I was about to say that uh, next week, I think we're heading toward the clothing that the priests were to wear. So uh, some of these little details, but I think we can learn a few lessons next week. So join us one week from tonight, and we'll be together in a look at Exodus chapter 28, if the Lord wills. Uh, as always, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, uh, let me know. I love hearing your feedback, and if there's unanswered questions we need to deal with, if there's something that I can research a little bit better, uh, let me know. We can certainly uh, bring us all up to speed next uh, next Wednesday if we can. Uh, if there's something we can do to encourage you, again, if there's something we need to be praying about in your life, uh, send me an email, give me a call, get in touch in some way. The email on your screen, hopefully still, info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for blessing us with a few moments where we can look at your word tonight. We're thankful for your instructions to your people back in the time of Moses. We're so thankful for the lessons that they learned in working together to get this done. And we're thankful that you preserved your chosen people down through the years so that your son could be born in the tribe of Judah. We're thankful for your inspired word and how it points us to your son and to what he did for us. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.